Welcome to Israel In Depth, where scholars, policymakers, and leading experts come to discuss topics about Israel in depth. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at UCLA and the host of this podcast. Joining me for this episode of Israel In Depth is Daniel Soberman. He is an assistant professor of international relations at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and is currently a fellow at the Middle East Initiative at the Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. Daniel is currently working on a book about asymmetric deterrence in conflicts involving resistance actors, as they call themselves, in the region, which includes the Lebanese group Hezbollah, Iran, Hamas in the Gaza Strip, and Yemen's Houthi rebels. His first book, published in 2004, was titled New Rules of the Game, Israel and Hezbollah after the withdrawal from Lebanon. And prior to joining academia, Daniel spent his mandatory military service in Israel, in Israel's military intelligence, following which he worked for the Arab, as Arab affairs correspondent for Israel's newspaper, Haaretz. Daniel, thank you for joining me today. Uh, it's a pleasure to, me. to have you on this podcast. Um, so um, given your expertise, I really want us to talk uh, about Hezbollah and the Houthis and the potential for uh, regional escalation in the Middle East. But before we get into um, the, the details, um, I think it might be useful for our audience uh, to understand this concept of asymmetric deterrence, which is at the center of your work. So could you just tell us a little bit about what that means, asymmetric deterrence, and how you apply that uh, in, your, in the book that you're working on? So asymmetrical deterrence, first of all, has to do with the manner in which relatively weak actors manage to get their way at the expense of far superior, militarily superior actors and manage to deter um, far superior actors from behaving in a way in which they um, otherwise would have. So the interesting thing about asymmetry in international relations is that oftentimes, uh, this is perhaps a bit counterintuitive, but very weak actors still oftentimes possess um, uh, bargaining power, coercive bargaining power. They possess cards, even though the cards they've been dealt are fairly poor ones and weak ones. Uh, they often manage to uh, harness them in, um, in a way that kind of offsets the otherwise overwhelming superior uh, strategy and capabilities of the superior actors. I see. So we can I can see how this would apply to uh, groups like uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis, all these uh, organizations that you've um, you've studied. Um, so let's now start then with uh, the Houthis, uh, since they've been uh, very much in the news over the last few days. Uh, following uh, U.S. and British uh, missile strikes against Houthi targets in Yemen. Um, before we talk about the strikes, um, were you surprised, as somebody who has studied the Houthis, and, um, were you surprised by their involvement in the war between Israel and Hamas since October the 7th? I mean, all eyes were really focused, at least initially, on Hezbollah, and along come the Houthis, and uh, start to get involved themselves by attacking uh, shipping in the in the Red Sea. Did this surprise you? How do you understand the Houthi decision to involve themselves in this conflict? Well, in general, I have to admit that I've been surprised by the the magnitudes uh, the magnitude of events uh, between Israel and Hamas, and in general in the Middle East. Uh, but with respect to the Houthis, um, I've been to, I've been surprised to a, to a degree. But um, the Houthis have, on the other hand, over the past, um, I would say, almost a decade, have become an integral part of this so-called um, self-described axis of resistance. The axis of resistance, as you alluded to earlier, consists of Hezbollah, uh, Hamas, Iran, obviously, because it's Iran-led, those are Iraqi militias. Um, in, in Iraq, uh, the Syrians, and obviously the Houthis. But the Houthis, um, who are more or less, I would say, a new actor in Israel's uh, strategic environment and in general in the strategic environment of the Middle East. So 
Um, I haven't been totally surprised by the way in which they've uh, contributed to the to the war effort. Um, probably mostly because I've seen just I've been following the Houthis now for um, almost a decade since the um, the Saudi led war against them in Yemen began in March of 2015. And I've seen over these years how they became became ever more integrated explicitly within this axis, within the axis of resistance, and explicitly and openly um, declare uh, time and time again that if there is a um, should a regional war break out, a war between even just Israel and Hezbollah, they would contribute to that war. They specifically, on numerous occasions, mention specifically the city of Eilat in Israel, uh, which is about 16, 1700 kilometers away from Yemen. Um, they specifically named that city as a city that would be targeted by them. So the fact that they had the, the capabilities, we knew. Um, the declared intent, we know. So I wasn't totally surprised, but I would say that in the in the context of the magnitude of, of events, um, I have to admit that, um, that I didn't see this coming to this degree. So, so in terms of the Houthis' strikes, they've they've been firing uh, missiles, uh, cruise missiles, and and sending um, drones toward Israel none of which have struck their targets, as far as I know, and obviously also repeatedly attacking shipping in the Red Sea. How effective or impactful uh, on Israel do you have these Houthi attacks been? I mean, are they a significant factor for the Israelis? Are they more of a nuisance, uh, you know, rather than any sort of more, you know, strategic threat? Um, how, do you, how do you rate the impact that this Houthi involvement's had so far? I mean, I don't see how we can, at this stage, uh, given what we know about the way the Houthis have been acting and impacting uh, regional and even global geopolitics, and uh, on the economic front, it's pretty amazing. I don't see how we can belittle their uh, their impact, their strategic impact at the moment. Um, the impact has been... Um, considerable. I mean, the very fact that they have managed to disrupt the shipping lanes, commercial ship shipping in, you know, in, in the Red Sea, that's a big deal. It's not just a big deal for Israel. It's also a big deal for the Egyptians, right? Um, and the very fact that we've needed the United States and other actors in the region who have also uh, uh, joined the effort in intercepting some of these drones and uh, and ballistic missiles, that is a very significant uh, development that we will have to bring into consideration from now on in our strategic calculations, for sure. So, so let me ask you then about uh, the recent uh, missile strikes that the United States and the UK um, carried out against Houthi targets in Yemen in retaliation or an attempt to kind of you know, deter the Houthis from continuing these attacks. Uh, do you think these, this escalation, if you like, by the US and the British is a good idea? And do you think it's likely to succeed in, I mean, already the Houthis have since being attacked, have, have most recently again struck a, a US uh, identified ship, uh, I think just yesterday. So, you know, is it was it is it a good idea that the Americans and the British have decided to do this, or do you worry that this is going to escalate the conflict even further in 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 the Red Sea region? I think that the United States didn't really have any other option after uh, several weeks of uh, of Houthi disruption on uh, on on such a magnitude of uh, you know basically international economy in a sense. Whether this is going to have a strategic impact on the Houthis, I don't think so. No, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very pessimistic about that. Just bringing into consideration the fact that the Houthis 
were able to withstand and survive um, a, an eight-year war with Saudi Arabia, with Saudi Arabia really, if you were following that, that war, they literally bombed anything that was <laughs> within their vicinity and uh, really held no punches. And the, it's, it's hard to threaten the Houthis having uh, been through you know, such a, a disastrous war with Saudi Arabia. And Yemen is a big country they have already shown that the, their military capabilities, military command and control, uh, their missile capabilities, drone capabilities, they are sufficiently resilient um, to the stronger party, uh, whether it's Saudi Arabia or now the United States. So in that respect, and they've shown and expressed over the past several days again, uh, their resolve to continue these um, these attacks. What would it take now? What's interesting about this so far, at least, is that Israel has avoided retaliating directly against the Houthis, uh, despite the fact that it's been directly the target of Houthi uh, missile uh, strikes. What would change the Israeli calculation in your mind, vis-a-vis -vis the Houthis? Um, I mean, that would it be? you know, casualty, Israeli casualties, or is Israel just determined to avoid direct engagement with the Houthis, which would open up potentially a three-front war? Exactly. So the first thing that we need to uh, to remember is that Yemen is very far away from Israel, right? And Israel's top priority right now has been for the past three months now, the Gaza Strip. And if there were to be a second front that opens up, that would be vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah and Lebanon. So I really don't see Israel really retaliating in a, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a very, you know, far-reaching manner against Yemen. Good news, I suppose, for the Houthis, at least. Okay, let's turn to Hezbollah. Um, you know, ever since the war between Israel and Hamas broke out, immediately following the horrific attack on October the 7th, um, there's been a kind of low intensity fighting uh, between Israel and Hezbollah on Israel's northern border. Um, but, you know, over the now near three months of fighting between the two sides, they've been careful to, you know, observe maybe the rules of the game, a term that you've used, uh, to, to maintain, to ensure that the fighting doesn't escalate uh, into a major confrontation. Um, but in recent weeks, particularly following Israel's targeted killings of a senior Hamas leader in Beirut and two senior Hezbollah commanders as well. Uh, and then Hezbollah's attack on the Israeli Air Force's command post at Mount Meon. Um, there's been much greater, I think, concern that a major escalation may well be um, likely, if not even inevitable. Um, so what's your view on this question of the kind of and uh, uh, the inevitability uh, of a conflict between Israel and Hezbollah. I mean, you've you've studied their interactions for over many years, uh, and ever since the last war between the two sides in two thousand six ended, the border has been reasonably stable, um, and a major war has been avoided. Do you think that's likely to continue, or do you think that a war is, as many fear now, um, unavoidable? No, I, I certainly don't think that a war between Israel and Hezbollah is, in, is inevitable. In fact, I think it would be, right now, it would be a very bad idea. What had kept, um, as you mentioned, uh, what had kept uh, stability along the Israeli-Lebanese border for se over 17 years, since 2006, was mutual deterrence. And that mutual deterrence didn't come about by, you know, by coincidence. It was something that the parties had invested or actively invested in establishing and maintaining uh, that balance of deterrence. But this came against the background of a very traumatic war in, in July, August of 2006 that neither side um, expected, desired, and both very much regretted. Right, uh, both uh, paid a a heavy a heavy cost, a heavy 
price, albeit the Lebanese obviously being the weaker actor, paid a much higher price. Nonetheless, since then, the parties have come, you know, it took a, it took a basically a month long war in 2006, uh, which was the first time that the parties really engaged in such a uh, far reaching massive escalation to make the parties understand the meaning of war between Israel and Hezbollah. And um, this has been some a, a traumatic experience for both parties, which they have been pretty much determined to, to repeat. And if there was anything on uh, this October 7th, which, there was a lot of uncertainty here, a lot of uncertainty in the first hours and the first days after Hamas unleashed this uh, massive cross-border terrorist raid. And people living on the northern, uh, along the northern border, you're, you're talking about thousands and tens of, tens of thousands of Israelis, many of whom were convinced that it was just a matter of minutes or hours before Hezbollah also unleashed uh, a similar assault on them. And this is one of the reasons that they basically relocated. They fled and there's these, they still haven't uh, come back to their, to their, to their homes. Um, I think that in the first day, what uh, kept the parties um, at bay and prevented the, the outbreak of a war uh, was simply their fear, fear of escalation. Because there are a lot of um, of, uh, of let's say opportunities, mm -hmm. definitely on the first few days for for a miscalculation. Just to give you an example, um, Israel's radar system, right, identified birds as incoming drones, right, which you know this instigated air raid sirens all over northern Israel. And at a time when the tension is so high and people are convinced, the military is convinced that Hezbollah is, you know, having already uh, gone into a state of preparedness against Israel uh, the first hours after Hamas's attack, this could have easily deteriorated into something uh, uh, much larger. And that didn't happen. The parties were very much... Um, um, just careful, very cautious, knowing what is at stake, what was at stake. Now, since then, since uh, October 8th, when Hezbollah initiated basically this war of attrition along the entire northern border of Israel, uh, they have been more or less abiding by, the, by, by that term, the rules of the game, um, and trying to keep, if there's an escalation ladder or continuum, what's the like a from on a one to 10 scale, both Hezbollah and Israel have been holding tight to the relatively lower rungs on that escalation ladder. So I would say right now they're on a two, maybe on a three, but out of 10. Right. Just to, give, just to give, give you a sense of how Israel's um, uh, behavior has changed. In 2006, in retaliation for Zabala's kidnapping of two Israeli soldiers, Israel bombed uh, deep inside Lebanon already on the first day or two. Lebanon, Lebanon's international airport in Beirut, other vital critical infrastructure. So on a scale of 1 to 10, back then in 2006, Israel retaliated on, on a 10, right. Right. at least a 10, maybe even an 11. And but now, given what is at stake, given the party's understanding of what it would mean to escalate, um, what it would mean to go to war, the, both parties are very much, um, I would say, careful of, of that scenario. So, so I mean, in the early in the early stages, as you know, the the fear, the concern focused on Hezbollah and whether Hezbollah, um, you know, as part of this axis of resistance was going to seek to escalate, was going to try to take advantage, perhaps, you know, once the Israeli, once the IDF entered Gaza, um, they might seek to escalate then. And, you know, the US also played an important role in deterring that. Um, now the concern seems to have shifted not from Hezbollah's potential to escalate, 
but rather that Israel's potential to escalate. In other words, the concern here is that not so much that Hezbollah might decide to initiate a uh, full-scale war, but that Israel might do so. And we've heard reports in the media, you know, that Yoav Galan, Israel's defense minister early on, was pushing uh, for uh, Israel to launch a war uh, against Hezbollah. Uh, there's growing uh, calls for that now. Um, and the argument, it seems, in part, is that, you know, you mentioned those Israeli civilians who have been displaced, who had to evacuate, leave their homes. Some around 80,000, I believe, Israelis who are still displaced from the north. The argument here is that essentially, you know, in order for them to return to their homes and live uh, along the uh, in their communities along the northern border, Hezbollah has to withdraw its forces to uh, north of the Latani River, that it cannot maintain that deployment um, of its, particularly of its elite force in the area bordering Israel, which it did for all of those years previously. Do you agree with that argument? I mean, do you think that um, the, the status quo ante with Hezbollah deploying its force up to the border, having the potential to carry out at any moment a kind of, you know, in raid and attack that Hamas did in the south, is that something that is no longer acceptable in Israel and therefore present that, that the only way to avoid a war will be for Hezbollah to withdraw its forces uh, away from that area? So these are two separate discussions. And you know why? Because it doesn't matter what I, as an expert, as someone who's been following Hezbollah for, for really for many years, for over two decades, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what my uh, what my, let's say, uh, cold analysis says about Hezbollah's can calculations and the fact, or my at least, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that Hezbollah would never have unleashed uh, the type of uh, raid that, has, that Hamas did. In fact, I think that Hezbollah, uh, they're probably shocked themselves by, by Hamas's uh, far-reaching, almost crazy uh, move. Yeah. Um, that doesn't matter because now we're in a stage where you need to convince all those, you know, tens of thousands of Israelis who've left their homes. And, you know, I don't live, I personally don't live along the northern border. It would be their call. It would, it's, it, it would be their decision whether or not they are willing to tolerate such a reality, given what happened in the Gaza Strip. Um, so these are really two separate dimensions. And obviously, as the state of Israel has to kind of balance both of them, right? So as a state, as a government, as a, as a, as a state or a defense establishment that thinks and, and articulates its thoughts in a strategic manner, um, I would imagine that uh, Israel, uh, the Israeli government would could seek a third path, right? Because I don't think anybody um, really wants war. In fact, the opposite is true. So you think at uh, the moment the Israel Israel's kind of statements, these kinds of threats, are more aimed at trying to, itch, uh, you know, support a diplomatic resolution. I mean, the Biden administration recently sent uh, Amos Hochstein to try to kind of come up yeah. with some sort of. Do you, so you think in some ways that Israel's, the the, the statements um, are more aimed at putting pressure on Hezbollah to reach a diplomatic solution rather than actually ramping up uh, the potential for war? That's exactly what I think is Israel is aiming at. Israel is aiming at a, a, a coercive campaign, trying to coerce Hezbollah, or coerce the Lebanese, or even put pressure on the United States, which obviously doesn't want a regional war here. Um, to to put pressure on Lebanon, right? Whether or not that succeeds, I it, it's hard to, again. It's hard to be optimistic about this because Hezbollah already has, and the Lebanese themselves have already declared that we're not going to even discuss any of this before Israel stops its war in Gaza, right? And the war in Gaza doesn't stop, as Nasrallah just said a couple of days ago. Uh, until Hamas declares that Israel has stopped the war, right? So basically all of this hinges on a resolution, uh, some agreement, whether tacit or 
semi-tacit or probably not formal, I can't imagine, formal agreement between Israel and Hamas, but some sort of an agreement that concludes the war in Gaza. So this really lives, leaves us in, um, in, in a bind. We're, we're, in a, we're in a very complicated situation right now with respect to the northern border, because here you have to somehow very delicately balance these, um, these different considerations. It's not going to be easy, but I think there is a, you know, a third path that definitely suboptimal but better off would be better off than an all-out war with Hezbollah, and that is to somehow revert back or try to revert back to an informal rules of the game, right? This is basically the framework that has guided and regulated the conflict between Israel and Hezbollah for at least thirty-two years now. So you have a leg, you know, this is decades of the parties really understanding how to manage this conflict. So there is something to build upon here. The, the, I mean, the problem is that it seems that in Israel, and at least within some parts of the Israeli security establishment now, the, the view is that that old kind of strategic concept of deterrence and establishing the rules of the game is, is, is no longer acceptable because Hamas, that was the same kind of approach that governed Israel's relations with Hamas. And Hamas obviously broke the rules of the game in a, in a, in a very shocking manner and the the view here is that you know we it's also not possible to go back to that vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah that that basically the only way to deal with these issues with these are, are to actually remove the threat physically moving Hezbollah's forces away from the border um not going back to the situation even though it was relatively stable as you said for many years between Israel and Hezbollah where it has those forces on the border that are able you know, whether they'd be willing to do that, but they certainly have the capacity to inflict, you know, carnage on Israeli civilians. Do you, so do you think Israel is like the strategic thinking in Israel has shifted in a way that it's going to make it very difficult to go back to that post mutual deterrence? No, I think at the end of the day, reality is going to have to assert itself on Israel's considerations. If I, if I'm, you know, to be realistic about this, we yeah. are, 102 days into the war in the Gaza Strip. This is an unprecedented war. You had hundreds of thousands of Israelis who have been, you know, uh, called up uh, for reserve service. Uh, the 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 costs are 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 horrific. All for also for Israel, both econ economically and in terms of uh, receiving on a daily basis the names uh, and of 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 fallen soldiers. Right. And this is three months. And even the Israeli army says we are not close to uh, reaching a decisive victory vis-a-vis -vis Hamas. And that's just Hamas in the tiny Gaza Strip with no strategic depth, with Israel on one, hand, on one side of it, the Egyptians and the Mediterranean. Hezbollah would be a completely different ballgame. And in that sense, I think that... Um, Again, the, the people living in, in northern Israel don't, you know, I, I don't even expect them to, you know, to, to buy into to my argument. But if there were, if Hezbollah ever had the thought of initiating something of, um, of that magnitude, I think um, uh, the, the images coming out of the Gaza Strip, with all due respect to Hezbollah's uh, strategic messaging over the past uh, several weeks, the Gaza Strip currently looks as if a nuclear bomb had been uh, had been dropped on it. The same could be said, by the way, about the Gaza envelope, about the all the the communities, dozens of communities, Israeli communities around the Gaza Strip. For all intents and purposes, what happened on October seventh. Is it's almost as if Hamas had dropped a tactical nuclear bomb on those communities, and what Israel, from I'm strictly talking here from a strategic uh, point of view, what Israel did over the past three months is basically, you know, they initiated a first strike and unacceptable costs on Israel, 
And now Israel has been basically trying to destroy them in retaliation. So if this uh, sounds to you like um, nuclear war or uh, mutually assured destruction talk, then that's no coincidence because that's what I have in mind. And I think that if there's anything that, if there's one thing that would uh, prevent a war between Israel and Hezbollah in the future, it's this very vivid uh, framework that has now come into existence of, yes, you can inflict unacceptable costs on Israel. However, five minutes later or several weeks later, you yourself are going to look like the Gaza Strip. So Beirut would be equally of far more uh, destroyed than whatever they would be able to inflict upon Israel. And that, I think, is sufficient to uh, for, for extending deterrence or renewing deterrence. Um, this is, I think, I think in, in, from a strategic point of view, I think this, uh, we can be fairly optimistic about that. So you think both sides, Hezbollah and Israel, recognize how destructive a full-scale war would be between them? I mean, you know, as you say, that it would be vastly more destructive than what we've seen already taking place between Israel and Hamas. Hezbollah's military capacities far exceed those of Hamas. Um, but do you, but, but, you know, so that's the kind of rational argument that both sides recognize this. But now we hear this talk uh, coming from Israel that, you know, um, war is inevitable sooner or later, and that ultimately these organizations cannot be deterred forever. And therefore, it's better to initiate a preventive war um, or, you know, that it's better to, to strike first rather than risk uh, the, having to make a second strike capability. You don't, therefore, am I right in thinking you don't really see that as a worrying signal of Israel's intentions to, to launch a war, but rather this is still more of the same game, if you will, of, of deterrence, only they're making threats as a way to uh, put pressure on. It's not really uh, likely to be uh, either side likely to initiate a war. Is that that's your bottom line? My bottom line, yes. I think that uh, the likelihood of all-out war between Israel and Hezbollah, I'm not ruling it out. Obviously, you can't rule out anything uh, after October 7th. But um, I think the likelihood of all-out war between Israel and Hezbollah uh, is is low at the moment. That's, that's I think, the, the optimistic uh, takeaway from, from my assessment. And you know what? I don't think a war between Israel and Hezbollah ever has to happen. Um, uh, which is, I know it sounds crazy, it's, it's, it's almost crazy to, to, you know, to speak in such terms, uh, given what we know about the Middle East and just the, what happened uh, three months ago. However, um, after 2006, after the war in 2006, everybody was convinced that a war, another war was not only inevitable, but also desirable in order to rectify the image uh, that was created by that war on Israel. And um, seven, here we are, 17 years later, and even now, having initiated a war of attrition, be, uh, initiated um, against Israel, you see that the, um, what we find is that the mutual deterrence on a strategic level is so fierce and so scary that both parties have, have, have been tolerating, both, both Israel and Hezbollah have been tolerating costs that until three months ago, we no one would have, uh, would have seen this coming. Um, with Hezbollah has already lost uh, over 160 of its men, right? And, and other infrastructure, and including senior commanders. And it has retaliated against these Israeli so-called violations of the rules of the game, Israeli escalation, in context and in proportion, which goes to show you that they do not want this to get out of hand. So that, in a sense, that, and Israel doesn't want this to get out of hand. So I think that the bottom line is that if both parties share this um, joint interest in resolving the, the current conflict, which is, in a sense, unprecedented, definitely unprecedented. Um, without a war, I think this very basic interest of both parties gives us 
uh, reason for some optimism regarding the, the future. Well, that's music to my ears, and I, I find that very reassuring. Uh, I, I, we're almost out of time, so I want to ask you one final question, because I feel like we would be remiss not to mention the Islamic Republic of Iran in all of this. We've talked about Hamas, we've talked about Hezbollah, we've talked about the Houthis, and of course, all of them are allies of Iran. And there's the argument, and you hear this very often in the United States, that really they're just proxies for Iran, and that really, you know, much as we've been talking about Israel's interactions with Hezbollah, or, or now the Houthis is getting involved, that it's really Iran pulling the strings, orchestrating all of this from behind the scenes. So to what extent do you think that's that's an accurate assessment? I mean, in other words, that is the art, is this is really what's going on Israel versus Iran? And you know, these are just different um arenas for this rivalry. And ultimately, any decision uh, by the axis of resistance to escalate uh, will be is will be one that's ultimately made by the decision makers in Tehran rather than by Nasrallah or by the Houthis. No, I think that the the perception that Iran is like, you know, is pulling all these strings and it's, uh, you know, uh, manipulating and orchestrating all these various uh, so-called proxies. I don't even agree with that term proxies in this in this context. I think these are proxy allies. These are not necessarily, these are not, this, these are not uh, patron-client relations. I think all of these relations are, are patron, patron, patron. So these are a, a lot more, you know, the, the, the relationships are a lot more equal than, than what uh, many people perceive. Ultimately, this does reflect the, the conflict in the Gaza Strip. All these conflicts uh, reflect on Iran's regional status because the axis of resistance at the end of the day represents, and each of these conflicts uh, in a standalone fashion represents ultimately at the most overarching level, the geopolitical struggle over the regional order of the Middle East, where you have an axis of resistance that is we've talked about that aspires uh, for a new regional order that relates to resistance as an ideology, but also as a strategy, as its organi organizing principle. And the way they present it, the way they perceive it, is that they are up against the, what we can call it the status quo um, regional order or the normalization regional order, uh, which includes Israel and Saudi Arabia and the moderate Arab countries and the Gulfies. And obviously they're, they perceive them um, as being oriented towards the United States and the West. And this is the way um, they analyze this and represent what is, going on right now in the Middle East. And I think this is this is an accurate, I think this is an accurate analysis of what's going on. So the conflict in the Gaza Strip ultimately uh, represents a much broader conflict between these two geopolitical blocks, geopolitical forces that are still over the past several years have been reshaping the balance of power uh, in the Middle East. And you see that the axis of resistance has to do not, not just with the ideology of rejecting the Zionist entity or the United States or the West or the you know, colonialism, et cetera, but it also boils down to a strategy. Resistance, mukawama, is also a strategy, an asymmetrical strategy that all these actors um, have adopted Iran, the Houthis, Hamas, Hezbollah, Hezbollah, the Iraqi militias, even the Syrians uh, to an extent, whereby they seek to offset the otherwise overwhelming capabilities of Israel, Saudi Arabia, the United States, etc. And all these actors have come to rely upon uh, Iranian technologies such as drones, precision um, guided uh, drones, missiles, et cetera. So what they have in common is capabilities, they have in common an ideology, a, an overarching uh, quest for a new regional order, 
and um, and even though they all have their own particular interests, right? They do not. This is not a complete harmony. Uh, mm -hmm. They all have their uh, specific constraints and interests, but overall, they do um, identify and as associate themselves with the axis of resistance, the axis of resistance in the Middle East, which they, by the way, all of them want to rename not the Middle East, but Western Asia, which is also an interesting, it was very telling, mm -hmm. uh, because the Middle East is a Western, you know, it's, it's a Western uh, term. And um, they've become over the past several years, uh, ever interconnected, coordinated. Um, and this is what this war is showing us in a in really in an unprecedented way, how all of these various resistance nodes across the Middle East are collaborating in a very calculated manner to, to assist Hamas and it's uh, war against Israel because they see the potential downfall of Hamas as something that would be very detrimental to the entire um, you know, uh, construct of the entire architecture that they're trying to establish and also very detrimental to the idea of resistance, that you have the idea that um, resistance, even though resistant actors are obviously militarily inferior, it would be extremely difficult, bordering impossible to reach a decisive victory against them. So this is something that all, this is at stake for all of them. So it's a very important point, I think, how much is at stake? This is, you know, with many people, uh, members of the public are kind of accustomed to thinking of, you know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in isolation from this border, from the broader region. And in a sense, it's important to recognize, as you're saying, that, you know, these what seem like disparate uh, conflicts or issues are in fact interconnected and that there's a much broader um, strategic competition going on. Uh, and all of these fronts, whether it's the Houthis, Hezbollah, Hamas, are all connected in that way. And so the stakes are even greater uh, than, than they might they may appear to be to many people. Um, I think it's a very important strategic conception. I'm very grateful to you for, for joining me today to, to discuss that and also to reassure me somewhat that maybe a war between Israel and Hezbollah is not about to break out anytime soon. Let's hope you're right. Uh, so Daniel, uh, thank you again on behalf of um, uh, the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. Uh, for, for joining me on this podcast. Um, and I want to thank all the listeners as well for joining me. Uh, you've been listening to an episode of Israel in Debt, produced by the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. Thank you for listening and be on the lookout for more episodes soon. Thank you. Thank you so much.